Grounding exercise. <laughs> um, I know, get my check out. you like it? <laughs> <laughs> and we're just going to start by sharing one word for our intention uh, here together. So I can start and then we'll, um, I'll pass it around. And my word for our intention is collaboration. Really clear. 
um, we understand we understand that you don't believe that things are fair and that that you have employees that are worrying about paycheck to paycheck and that um, and that you're concerned that you're being treated differently than others and we feel your pain and, and we acknowledge it so I really want to start there because that is that is the place that we're coming from is is acknowledging you know and, and understanding that we feel it I mean, that is that is your that is how you feel and that is true to you and we 100% acknowledge that on the numbers piece we don't see eye to eye um, and we're clear to that we're clear on that and so our hope is that we can um, demonstrate today a movement towards solving some of these challenges um, so that's that's the framework and also just in terms of the dynamics of the meeting our best hope for the meeting today was as Rob said that we would engage in meaningful conversation but if necessary take some take some breaks I mean we have less than two hours um, and if we can take quick breaks and talk about things and come back and try to have some forward movement um, we believe that that would be a good thing. Okay. Okay. So we, for our team, Do you have it to put up there so they can see or not? Uh, we don't have it to put up there. Um, What's that? Unfortunately, sorry. Okay. okay, Rob. Um, so you'll you'll see that. Our proposal number three is is different, and um, I wanted to give Rob Price an opportunity yeah. to talk about what that means. But let's <clears throat> let's start, I think, a little bit, uh, just because we probably have some people in the room that haven't seen uh, all of number one. So, Sean, you seeing this, I believe. Probably your team has seen this with the original 75th percentile based on age data. The positions that fell outside of the <clears throat> minus 5%. Originally, custodians were moving. Um, I'll make sure I understand this to a grade five. So, you've seen this, right, Sean? This was based on probably uh, is that the one Steve sent me? Yes, just want to make sure that we're all in the same. So, the positions, um, fleet service technician one, culinary center production assistant, maintenance mechanic grounds, head custodian three, custodian, environmental technician, uh, maintenance mechanic buildings, parts clerk, bus dispatcher, transportation router, and graphic designer, were all outside the 5%. So, we've given BBCA information on where those would move. Bus drivers fell at right, as, right at minus five, and food service assistants <coughs> fell at minus 3.5%. Now, according to the methodology, those positions wouldn't be moved. Now, we have recognized, and I started working on this last summer, uh, when we were short 71 bus drivers in transportation. Um, as everybody know, we put a working group together trying to solve this problem. And today I'm no closer than we were back in last summer. Uh, we tried to reach this staff around 225. Last I checked, we had 148 drivers. So these have become extremely hard to fill positions. So have food service assistant one positions. Those two positions uh, in BDCA have been the hardest to fill for our district. So in response to that, Bus drivers, we are proposing the move from range 12 to range 13, and food service assistant ones range two to three. 
So on the new wage schedule, bus drivers would go to $22 an hour as a starting to $30.34 as a topic. Food service assistant ones would go from 1513 to 1990. Those would be the new ranges. So that is with the cost of living adjustment of 3.5% and the move from range 12 to range 13. All the other positions I talked about that fell outside were also moved. The culinary center production assistant right now moves to range four under the new market analysis. I have submitted a reclass for that position. We have seven of those employees in the culinary center. So we are submitting that because we believe the job description, the duties are 20% more than what was originally in the job description. So we believe that falls outside of negotiations but falls into a re, what we call a reclassification process. So I have just submitted that. Um, that will take a little bit of time to get through the system. Again, I, this is really in response, as we've talked about, we've got increased competition. We're all seeing Amazon and FedEx and uh, UPS driving around. Um, we continue to struggle with our food service assistant one positions. There's a number of ideas why we struggle with those positions. And then as we've talked about before, the 3.5% cost of living, the steps, uh, the increased mechanic tool allowance we agreed to, and then uh, the group insurance, I think I've let Russ, Russ talk about that. But any questions on really number three there? The, the positions that you would move the range is on, would that be on top, a step on top of that also? So they would get a step plus change ranges? Yes. I'm, I'm going to look to Steve to make sure I'm answering that correctly. Yeah, that's Steve, right. they're going yes. to move, the they're gonna move up the range okay. and keep their step and move up a step also. They're still eligible for a step. Those that are eligible for a step will still, still receive a step. step. Yep. I do know that there was some discussion about another district getting a substantial raise, and I want to continue to highlight the benefits in this district. Just me doing a quick 30 minute search on this, that other district that was highlighted, those employees pay upwards of two to three hundred dollars a month for health insurance where our employees are not. And I do think that has to be taken into account when we're looking at this. We're, we're really trying to compare us against other districts out there. Um, please keep that in mind. So with that, can I ask one question? Yep. I'm sorry. Yep. So where does it look like the culinary center production assistant will fall after the reclassification? That's going to be human resources goes through that process and then they'll determine that. Right now it goes from a three to a four. So we believe it's more than a four, but they'll have to determine what that is actually. Okay. Exactly is going to be happening with the employees over there. So you mentioned the assistants, but what about our cooks and the drivers? It's so the cook right now, and this is based on uh, Teresa's market analysis, the culinary center production cook. That's the one that we don't have enough data on. I think that's the one, that one position that Teresa still needs to do some work on. Okay. Um, am I correct in that, Russ? There was a footnote that she doesn't, she wasn't able to find a job match. Yes, Steve's giving me a thumbs up, that's correct. Okay, so, 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 go ahead. If there's no job match, then there's no movement for them? I hate to pull Steve into this. Steve, if there's no job match, there's no movement for them, or we just need to do more work on that position? Uh, it becomes an internal equity piece that we look at if we can't find outside market that. Okay. Right now, they're at the same. 
uh, pay grade as the KSL2. <coughs> KSL2 requirements are typically between 450 and 800 meals and how much meals? We are producing close to 14,000 meals. Yep. And, and prior so. to the change in the schedule, um, when we went to the 14 step schedule, they were two grades above KSL2s. Now they're the same grade okay. as KSL2s. So it just, from an equity standpoint, you would think they would be getting more. Okay. I just, nope. there's talk. Oh, you know, people are frustrated. So then there's talk that I could go and do two jobs. Yes, I'd be working two jobs, but it wouldn't be the stress, the environment, it wouldn't be as hard, and I would potentially make more. So there's talk about people leaving if we aren't getting compensated. Okay. So, so right now they are in a range of 10. Um, that's something that we need to work with STEAM on. Since we don't have that data, what does it look like? But we'll keep that in mind. You're saying the duties out there are significantly more than what they yes. would be in a high school kitchen. Yeah, and if you break it down, I mean, we're each, there's 12 employees over there. Yep. And so you break it down where each, each person is basically responsible for over a thousand meals. And that's a lot. Okay. And the environment is very cold. Okay. So we each of us have put a few questions together. I put a whole bunch in, in the spirit of not going back and forth. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of them. Um, I'm just going to kind of throw it out to any of you guys to really answer. Um, do any of you currently know the average rent for family? The average what? The average rent in Boulder County. Currently, right now, a little less than this, $2,263 in Boulder County to rent a one bedroom apartment. A mid level head custodian brings in $2,527. That's after para insurance and all that stuff. Um, in Boulder County, 58% of Boulder County is right. Do you know what the average grocery bill currently is in Boulder County for a month for a two-person family? Eight hundred. It's four hundred fifty dollars seventy-two cents. You eat well. That's just the groceries. That's the Yeah, that's just groceries. Uh, two more quick ones. Do you do you know what the monthly income requirements for Boulder County are to receive food stamps? 20, what is it, 25 so that's less Right now, for Boulder County, for a family of four, if you bring in $2,871 or less, you qualify for food stamps. So for a family of four, one person working because the other parent has to stay home and watch the kids on the side. That family of four on what we're making as a, a mid-range mid head custodian, I qualify for the service. Uh, the district says that they want to stay within the model of the 75th percentile. My question is, why are there still so many positions well under that model? Night custodians at 37 percent, head custodian in elementary school 64th, Head custodian in the middle is the 50th, and head custodian in the high school is the 55th percentile. So if we want to say it's, you know, plus or minus 75th, why are there so many? Those, just those four positions alone are below 75th percentile. I can show you that. Yeah. Sean has the numbers on that. So, and this probably. Molly, you might be able to answer this. Why, why, why is there a pay range difference between a head custodian, elementary, middle, and high school? <coughs> why do we have different ranges for those positions? My understanding is based on the square footage of the building and the number of people that you have to supervise. So you would think a high school head custodian has more square footage than managing that they have more people to supervise. Okay. Then, um, why do we use the same
any market data, city authority, and the Boulder County government for all three head custodian positions as comparators. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. The, my understanding, and I'll answer this and then the rest you jump in, is I think we need to be careful of making a snap decision or remove public and private data. And I think there's several instances where it helps, and there might be a few instances where it hurts. But I don't believe we should make a quick decision in this negotiation just to pull it off. And I think we can give you a few examples. I don't know if we're prepared to do that today. But where it actually helps that individual position only a few percentage points one way or another but I do believe that requires further study because we've sat in these negotiations before where it has actually helped us bump the pay for some of these positions so um, I would just tell us to be cautious but does that make sense you're using the same position from the private sector data to compare to three different levels of pay grades I mean does that yeah, no, yeah, I don't think the question is no, using the private sector data, just the fact that for elementary, middle, and high school, she's using the same number. Yeah. And like, like you said, you know, each one, you know, high school is more responsibility than elementary. If you're using the same data for all three positions, the, the two uh, positions you're using the same data for all three positions, ones that you know middle and high school have a higher pay grade and those private sector data numbers are significantly reducing the high school number goes from the 63rd percentile with the private sector data without it it's a 55th that's a big difference that, that's the difference between a pay grade increase in the middle school is even is even larger. It goes from um, 250 um, or the 50th percentile without it to 59. So they're moving up. Here they're moving up one, but they could even with the private sector data they could move up two and be at the 75th. With without it, they would need to move up at least two, if not three, to get to the 75th. So there's a lot of movement that we're not seeing because they're using these private sector numbers that may be a match for the elementary school because they're, 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 they're positions for like a rec center or something similar in size to an elementary school. They're not they're not they're not cleaning buildings the size of middle schools and high schools. That's what the positions are. Which is why they, those numbers, while they reduce elementary school slightly, they're pretty close. But when you start moving them into the middle and high school levels, they make a huge difference. You just think, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, my school, where I've got 42,000 square feet, I only supervise one night custodian, compared to Nick, who's got seven night custodians and how many hundred thousand square feet? I mean, it's a big difference to use the same number. That's the way I look at it. And so, so, so does, I mean, does, does that seem fair to you guys? I'm just trying to get your impression of, you know, this, this, how would you feel if you were on our side? And just like, this data was being used. Yeah, with, Trace is the one that does the analysis. I just don't, I've never looked at the job descriptions of City of Gordon versus what she's comparing this to. So that's why I, I can't. Yeah, I mean, I would, what, what I would say, Sean, again, is that um, we are open to discussing things like this, right? Like specific situations that you present where it, it, it seems like there's something that needs to be looked at further. And the way that we would do that, of course, is we would go back and speak to Teresa and we would share these concerns and we would have a conversation with her, which we can have with you there, as we've done before, to have a better understanding. Um, I want to be clear that 
as we discussed the 75th percentile, um, we're not saying there's not room for some improvement, right? We're not. We're not saying that there's not room for improvement, that it's not something that shouldn't be looked at, right? Um, and we can talk as, as we continue to have these discussions over the course of today, you know, um, see where it goes, but we can talk about maybe engaging in a process that would really bring these questions out and let, let us all look at it with various experts. Our struggle is that we do not believe that disrupting the process that we've had, which we believe we believe that, you know, when you look at the data, um, the vast majority of the data is is supportive of the <coughs> fair compensation philosophy. And and we do not believe that in the midst of negotiations is the time to change something like that. It's too abrupt, right? But if we need to have discussions and we can look at it together, we're absolutely open to having that process. I think that's what this process is for us, is to work on that so we, we can change it. We talked about it all year long and nothing changed, so this is the time to make those changes during negotiations. And it was brought up last year by me, and I was told too bad. So I don't want to hear too bad. I want to hear answers of why we have an MOU that doesn't say anything about private sector data in it. It's not dated. It's not signed by you guys. It's not signed by us. And to me, there's no plus minus on my 75%, and I brought that up last year. And I was told that's the way it is, and I said it doesn't exist if it's not in writing. And you have very many times this negotiations, and I've watched you with paras. You want stuff in writing. You want more information, constantly. I want more information. I want it in writing. It's not in writing. It's not signed by you. It's not signed by Tina. It's not signed by Dan. Where did it come from, and why did I not get to agree to it? Why was I told last year at negotiations that that's the way it is? And it's too bad if I don't like it. That person is in this room that told me too bad. It's not too bad. It's wrong. It's and this is the place to talk about it and to change it. Team. So is there other positions where you are concerned? Is this Some of the maintenance positions the, the, with the use of private sector data in those, it significantly reduces. So building uh, maintenance mechanics is broken out to buildings and grounds. Yep. Um, they, with, um, let's see. And I believe that should just be maintenance mechanics, right? I'm only the, the strat has never been presented, that MOU. So we've never brought that into this for discussion. It was presented, uh, Steve's presentation was broken out into two um, different groups. Okay. His, his, his proposal to us had it broken out into <coughs> Right. When we looked at, when Teresa did an analysis, but right now the way the wage schedule is, it just still is maintenance Right, I, I, my yeah. I guess I just assumed that you guys had some mechanics that were going to go into buildings and okay. some that were going to go into grounds, but those hadn't been identified. That is, an, we have not done that. Just so then where been. would the maintenance mechanics that currently sit at range 12 go? Because it says range 12 to 13 for grounds, and it says range 12 to 14 for buildings. Okay. have them as a new grade of 14 for buildings. I'm showing 14 for buildings. Oh, well, I don't think I got that. Okay. So, Sean, um, um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> just a real quick question around the 75th percentile. Uh huh. And because I've heard conversations around that, and then the way it's calculated. So, is the issue around the 75th percentile 
there, there's or is, two. It, is, it, is it the way it's being calculated? Because I know there's different. I guess a, a bit of both. So the, it's the calculation and the use of private sector data. It's also the 5% um, plus or minus. Um, we understand that not every position is going to land at 75th, but on average, they, it, some are going to be slightly below, some are going to be slightly above. I mean, above, and on average, they should be fairly close to the 75th percentile. I mean, that's what that means is to target the 75th percentile is to, on average, be at the 75th percentile. But we are 5% below that. So that's not really targeting the 75th percentile, it's targeting 5% below. And, and there are a lot of positions that move out of range that when they move them back into range, it's again, it's not the 75th percentile, it's just within that 5%. No one ever goes above the 75th percentile once they drop below it, which that doesn't how is that the same? How, how do you target something but you're not even close to it? How, how do you present it? I mean, that, that seems to be the district's presentation is we're targeting the 75th percentile except 5% plus or minus, but it's, it's always minus. I mean, there are a few positions that are plus, but they don't, they're just, you know, you know maybe 10 employees, 20 employees out of almost 500 employees. That doesn't seem fair to me. I mean, I, I would love to hear what you guys think. I, I think, I, I, think um, I think we'd like to take a break. I'd like to take a break. Okay. I'd like to take a break. Okay. All right. So we provide you guys with another proposal. We provide you with two proposals since you gave your initial proposal. Um, we'd love to give you some time to take a look at it and then talk to us about it. We don't believe it's productive to talk about the specific jobs. Um, we just don't. We don't believe it's going to help us resolve this. Some of the technical questions that you're asking and you want answers for, um, we can get those answers, but they require us to take a look at it. You know, you're, you've come in prepared to ask certain questions and um, we want to be thoughtful in our answers, but again, we're not convinced that going back and forth like this, and this is what we said in the beginning, is helpful to finding resolution. And so what we propose is that we hear what your thoughts are on our proposals. Um, so I wasn't here last week, but I understand that we delivered our response to your first proposal, right? You did? That, that, that occurred? So right. we took care of that part. We have your second set of proposals, which you just delivered to us. Yes. I think we have a few questions that hopefully can um, hopefully help us make a little bit of progress in understanding where you're coming from. Um, and I think we can do a little bit of general question and answer now. Um, and then yes, we might need additional time to process. Um, so, and this is um, going to double back to the MOU. Um, since the MOU is the basis for your philosophy. Sorry. Is this up, anybody? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, so. I know. I I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know And if you guys could use yours too, we did get that comment uh, okay. that they can't hear you guys. Is this either. helpful? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, guys. Um, so one of the things. I'm <laughs> uh, sorry. I should just like. Yeah. Here you want um, the big one. Put it on your collar. Uh, no, I mean I, I can need to just go ahead and scroll up some things. Is this is this sufficiently close? Okay. I'm also a low talker, so. Apologies all around. Um, um, so one of the things that you've um, that you presented, that you um, reasserted, that you keep kind of coming back around to is the philosophy of the 75th percentile. 
that is something that for a number of years was the driver at these bargaining sessions between the BCDA and the district and informed a lot of the conversations. Um, and I think we need to have, um, it's probably useful, I would say, for us to have um, a common understanding about what that is and what it isn't if we're going to I think, make more substantial progress on some of um, how it's applied. Um, on page 61 of the BBCDA agreement, if Beth had it open earlier, and um, I have a copy here that I can copy, but sorry, you can scribble on. Um, on page 61 of the BBCDA BBSD agreement, it offers up a memorandum of understanding that's the, the basis for a lot of our conversations. Um, that MOU is something that our team questions um, its utility and we question its validity. And we've been, I think, fairly specific about why that's the case. But setting that aside momentarily, let's also take a look at its contents. And we have brought this forward on more than one occasion that, number one, the MOU does not contain references to private sector comparables. And number two, it contains no references to a margin of error of 5% plus or minus regarding wage differentials. We understand that a part of that was just the way that business was done at this table year after year between the BCDA and the district. But part of what we are asserting is that those have become blockers. But what's more important is that that was never placed in writing. It was an annual verbal agreement that existed between the parties. You are attempting to hold us to a verbal agreement that existed in years past, and this team has profound difficulty with it because it's an inhibitor, it's a blocker. It is what is standing between the members of this bargaining unit in adequate and appropriate compensation. So one of the things that I think you can expect from us, I won't promise this now, um, is that I think we're very much interested in there being a successor document to this that actually spells out some of the things that should be the subject of conversation regarding comparables and perhaps things that should not. One of the things that's a frustration for our team and it needs to be understood. An MOU is attached to the agreement, it is not a part of the agreement. There are differing legal opinions as to whether or not memoranda of understanding are enforceable as part of the agreement. But the greater point is, is that we have a document that doesn't even have signature lines for the respective president or, you know, the person, you know, the BBSD counterpart, whether it's an assistant uh, superintendent of human resources or president of the board or superintendent. There's no signatory, there's no date, there's no expiration. It doesn't even say where it begins. This is a source of profound frustration for our team. And we've attempted to articulate that very clearly and assertively, assertively yet politely, but it is troublesome that the conversation returns to this particular document when, number one, while we have a philosophical disagreement about it, number two, it's basically being used as a basis for, for practices at the table that this team no longer approves of or abides by. And number two, they were never part of the document to begin with. And so perhaps if we can have some common understanding there, then some of the smaller issues or things we can kind of address or speak to or help to sort out. Um, we, we hear what you're saying about the individual job classifications. I think that that's another challenge for us, but one that hopefully we can sort out later. But it's very, very difficult for us to move forward and to continue to have meaningful conversations when that document, as flawed as, as it is, is basically held up as the standard for our conversation. So having said that, I don't know if other members of our team want to um, kind of contribute to that particular point of view or, or amend it or offer their own perspectives, but that's something that is um, impossible for us to ignore at this juncture. Joan, I just... I wasn't here uh, when this, let's see if this works. I 
believe was this established 10 to 12 years ago? I definitely wasn't here. Were you here when this was established? No. No. Okay. Um, just a couple things to point out. I'm looking at to Article 14, as you referenced that that MOU on page 61 is not signed. Um, Article 14 though does reference the 75th percentile, correct? And then also the Transitional Salary Task Force, uh, page 60 of that document, if I'm correct, um, also acknowledges that 75th percentile, which was a signed document, correct, by Dan and Tina. So I do believe, I'm not saying uh, this shouldn't be studied further, but for this negotiation, this is the agreement that we have in place. I just, when you're referencing just 61, it seems like there's a couple other references in the agreement that are different than what was just presented. Um, before we took a break, I asked how you guys feel that your pay was 5%. Not the 70th, but five percent below the 75th. So dollar-wise, on average, you know, if you're trying to target the 75th and you're five percent below, would you feel fairly compensated? I, I appreciate the answers from you guys. My response to that, if, if I have to look back in board docs, but this presentation was given to the board in 2018, I believe, it might have been 17 or 18, when they first, we had a board of education that was questioning administrator salaries at the time, and they wanted to make sure that administrators were at the same 75th percentile as everyone else, and Teresa with the home team presented at that board meeting that were held administrators uh, BBCA, I don't remember who else, but was all held to that plus or minus 5% within the 75th percentile. Um, I could be mistaken, but I do believe, John, you might have attended that meeting, um, but I could be wrong. That was a board meeting, and do you recall that? BBSD board event? Yeah. In fact, I think it was 17 or 18 when Teresa presented all this information, how it applies to different levels. It doesn't apply to teachers, it didn't apply to principals, but it did apply to administrators, class five. I don't know how it applies to office professionals. And are you getting paid at the 75th percentile, or are you getting paid above or below that? I get paid what the district sets it as, but I do know the methodology was set at 75th percentile for all administrators. That was yeah. the methodology. I'm asking, yeah. are you being paid at that point, or are you being paid above? I've got to assume enough that I am, but I've never went out and did my own market analysis on my salary. Sean did some. Yeah, I have you pretty close to the 100th percentile. Yeah. And that'd be a question for human resources, how I was placed. Yeah, human resources right there. Okay, so we're asking you about that. I mean, again, I, I share my understanding. This is our sincere understanding that administrators follow the same philosophy. Now, if, um, again, you have to recall that the philosophy of 75% doesn't mean that people don't exceed 75%. Correct. There are, correct, there are people in Unit C that exceed 75%, correct? Correct. Okay, so to ask Rob where he is on that 70%, 75% doesn't take into consideration, you know, the other elements, right? Of course, there are other elements. So I don't okay. I don't understand the nature of the question. How many of you are at 75th percentile or below? And how many of you are above? And how do you get above? Yes. We have how many 500 in our unit or more? And there's probably only a very small portion of those 500, a couple. You know, there's like one, per, one plumber, one electrician. You know, we're talking large groups of people that are below. You guys are above. So, I mean, I addressed this. I addressed this the last time we talked about this. I'm happy to do so again. Which is, 
um, human resources in conjunction with BCA has had a long standing practice of not bringing in new Union C employees above step seven. So the reason that's relevant, and it, it's not it's it's not uncommon for a union to advocate for something like that. We have other unions that have something like that because they're interested in protecting internal equity, right? Making sure that the folks that are already there don't get, you don't have people that come in that end up coming in higher regardless of their experience. What that means with that practice is that if you have a bus driver that comes in the door with years and years of experience, with that practice, they're limited to step seven. Human resources in general, what I would say, you know, but what I would say the best practice is, moving forward, is that when you have employees join a group, um, they should be valued based on the experience that they're bringing to their group. So if you have someone that's a custodian, that's been a custodian for 15 years, all of that experience should be taken into consideration. And when you look at administrators, there hasn't been that cap. The specific experience of administrators is looked at, the years of experience are looked at, and they're placed accordingly. Now what about people who are brought in at step seven, five, six, seven, who don't have experience? that when you're bringing them in at that step because you can't get people in the door unless you pay them more. It is not my understanding, I mean, I understand you said it, but it's not my understanding that folks are being placed at step seven without um, relevant experience. So our question also is what's relevant experience? You know, we have someone who's never driven a bus, never worked with kids, and yet they're coming in at step seven. They might have driven a, something else, a dump truck or a uh, cement truck that's not a vehicle, it's full of children. They've never worked with children, but they're still getting in at step seven. So my thinking is you need to do that because they're not, they're not gonna come in. That's, that's not something we do. We, we are not, we are not trying to stretch um, experience in order to put someone higher on the incoming scale we're trying to value someone's experience i guess what she's saying is it's happening yes. in the district and people are are coming in that my understanding and according to Teresa's presentation is new people with little to no experience come in at step one and if Correct. the more experience they have, obviously the higher up they go. Yes. But we have a majority of our, our drivers are coming in at step three or higher with no relevant experience. So that's that's due to the fact that the market demands that we, we start them at step three because step one won't bring them in the door. Again, it is not my understanding that we do that. If you have if you had outside of this meeting or the protect confidentiality people, if you had some folks that you wanted to share with us that we could take a look at, we'd be happy to do that and take a look at it and be able to answer that question very specifically about why they, you know, did they, do we believe that they brought the experience that is where they're placed in? What is your title? HR director. So who's making those decisions on our, who starts at step seven? We have a rubric that we use. We have a staffing team, and we have HR directors that all work together. Russ, um, I think we want to caucus really quick, but um, before we do that, um, do you guys have the dollar amount on your proposal? How much it's gonna cost? Um, I believe we do. Can we get that when we come back? Yes. Okay. Thank you. How much time do you want? Ten minutes. Uh, we called the caucus, so uh, I guess we should.
Let me back up. Um, so we will have a response to the proposal that you uh, that you put forth. Uh, you should have that for you uh, that written response in writing at the commencement of the next session. Um, also, uh, we will have uh, an additional proposal that will address um, the contents of 14A and the MOU just regarding the 750 percent because I think you've made clear um, our, our issues with that. Um, that said, um, I think Sean and members of the team, I think, had just a couple of other things that they wanted to uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, to tell my story. To, we kind of, you guys wanted stories, and I'll stop picking on you and I'll just tell some stories. <laughs> Make it, I have some of questions, but they're easy questions as opposed to that. I kind of wanted to touch a little bit on what Will had said um, about, you know, he kind of asked you where, where do we, how hard is it to live in Boulder, et cetera, et cetera, county, not in Boulder. Um, so I've been working for the district for seven years. I have three children, so I am a family of four. I am the sole person that brings home money in my house. So I fall into that family of four. I do not qualify for food stamps, and I'm happy. I mean, it means I make some money. I do qualify for free and reduced lunches for my kids. CCAP, which is after, is child care. And CHP, which is free health insurance for my kids, except one just turned 18, uh, age added. Those of us sitting over here need those services to survive. I can't pay for those on what I make. And that's just the bottom line is, and I'm getting paid high on the scale, I think I'm on a step 12, or maybe 11 this year. So um, if I'm on a step 11 or 12, and everybody below me, how are they supporting their families on this wage? Um, we're worth more. I don't know, in your opinion, do you want to sit over there and say, you're totally happy with the fact that your employees have to be on government assistance to get by. Because you're not on government assistance, it's not a great feeling to be on government assistance. I was you know, kind of happy, like I said, that I don't qualify for food stamps. I'm like one step above the food stamp category. Um, that does not mean that I couldn't use them because I got them during um, COVID. Because anybody that was on free and reduced lunch got food stamps, basically. And that is what's gotten me through the last two years. I now have to pay, I just said my daughter aged out of CCAP or ACHP, Child Health Plan. So now I have to pay for her. That is not a pretty sight in my book. Um, it's going to cost me, I had to get on your plan. So it's going to cost me $110 a month for 10 months. And that doesn't include your dental insurance. I can't even afford dental insurance, so now she's not having that. Um, I came with 10 years of driving experience and 25 years of experience of working with children. I started with step three which at that time was out of six, I believe. So that's what you're saying you're starting people at now. Step seven is half of our steps. So I did start at the bottom, pretty happy about that. But that's a lot of experience that I came with and started with step three and worked my way up. In right now, we are spending thousands of dollars on charter trips. I've asked why we can't get that. Why can't I do that? Why can't you pay me overtime to 
to work a field trip and they're told we're not allowed to pay you overtime. We're not allowed to do trips in overtime. So meanwhile, I've had several occasions to talk to these charter drivers. One in particular I've run into several times. So of course, what do you do when you see another bus driver? How much do you make? 30 to $80 an hour on average. 30 to $80 an hour. Does she have benefits? No. $30 an hour is only slightly above what I get paid. So if I got paid 30, that's only $4 more than I get now, I probably couldn't buy your benefits or comparable benefits. $80 an hour, I certainly could. So you're paying a charter driver anywhere between 30 and $80 an hour to do what I could do and it would only cost you time and a half for me to do it. That's much less than $80 an hour. Less than 70, less than 60, less than 50. Actually, the trips are like about 1500 So that's what the driver's getting. So I know it's costing you guys more. I don't know the numbers. You guys are sure can find these numbers. But I've seen this person several times. She's shown me her trip tickets. $210 for a three hour trip, $70 an hour. I'm not being paid $70 an hour. I want to know where is this money coming from to pay for these charter trips? What pot is this coming out of? Can, can I answer that? Yes. Okay, I can answer that. The challenge is our route drivers, our, what's it, it's on. Our route drivers are needed when we are chartering trips yes. to drive routes, right? So we don't have enough drivers to cover both the routes and our trips. Everybody understands that? Yes. I would like to know who told you that you can't work overtime. Not that I can't work overtime, but that trips are not allowed to be. Right now, yeah. there is a steadfast rule that they are not allowed to give us trips that would put us into overtime. I will find out about that. So but you don't think that maybe that's not the case? I will find out. You'll find out. <laughs> what I don't know is, is are you limited to the number of hours you can drive in a given time frame by CDE? That's what the, that's where my mind goes if somebody has that logic. Okay. So I need to dig into that a little bit I further. I will find that hourly rate out. But that is the yeah. issue 